Hello, everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. Um, today, is, I'm the only host. Uh, Antonio is having technical problems, and so he might join us whenever the technical problems get better. And Neil is visiting his, uh, his parents, and his father is 80 years old today. So congratulations to Neil's father. Today, we have Ryan Graham. He's the um, CTO for Text Help, and um, I, they have been around a long time, and so we're going to have a really rich conversation about, you know, what they do, but also where they've been and what they've learned along the journey. So, welcome to the program. Thanks, Deborah. Really great to be here, and of course, happy birthday as well to, to Neil's father. Nice. Um, so, I'd like to start off just with a, a little bit just about myself um, and what I do here at Text Hub. So as you said, I'm the, the Chief Technology Officer here at Textop. Um, just a bit about me personally, uh, I am from a family of teachers. So my dad has a degree in special education. Uh, he was a special educational needs teacher for a lot of years. My sister is also a special educational needs teacher as well. <laughs> and my wife is also a primary school teacher. So I'm from yeah. a very big family of teachers surrounded by teaching all my life. Unfortunately for me though, I am not a very good teacher. So <laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't a job opportunity or a career opportunity for me. But what I was passionate about is I was passionate about software and helping kids and helping students, you know, and helping them in their day-to-day -day lives and helping kids with, with disabilities as well in particular. So that is what drove me to Text Hub. It's, it's just one of those uh, companies that really does truly make a difference in people's lives through uses of, of, uh, of assistive technology software. So a little bit about text up then and our background. So we are an assistive technology company and we create software that helps everybody across the globe be understood and also to understand as well. So we create apps that help people read, write and understand content and whether that's their own language or whether it's mathematics, for example, as well. Uh, the company itself was actually founded by our current CEO, Martin Mackay over well over 20 years ago now actually. Um, the, the whole sort of journey for us started actually, and it started for Martin, uh, whenever his father actually suffered a stroke and he struggled to communicate. Uh, and Martin obviously as a, a technology enthusiast just saw an opportunity here to help his father um, communicate better. So he developed a piece of software that he could give to his father that he could type on a keyboard and very, very quickly build out a sentence so that he was able to effectively communicate. And from those beginnings, that was again over 20 years ago, we built out our software over those years and, and that really formed the basis of our product, uh, Read and Write, that we have today. Um, so we've been around for a long time. We've been you know, helping people building out accessibility products for a long time. Um, and since then as well, we've also been building out a whole suite of products helping people with not just reading and writing English, other languages, and as I mentioned, mathematics as well. Yeah, I know that I've known about text to help for a long time. I know with my former company, Tech Access, um, we actually had Browse Aloud loaded on our site because we really, we really appreciated what you were trying to do. And I, when you say you're an assistive technology company, um, I know that's part of the, the journey. And um, because when I was working with uh, Text Help Browse Aloud, you know, many years ago, um, you, you know, we were, using, we were saying you were an accessibility company, right? So one thing that you could do was you could put te uh, Browse Aloud on your website and the web website would read to you. Now, of course, it wouldn't solve all of your other accessibility issues, but it could solve these issues, it, part of the issues, right? So that one thing that we were suggesting to clients is this is one way to solve part of it while you're working on the rest. But at the same time, I know that started causing confusion and there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace right now with like overlay tools, which are not an overlay tool, but do you mind talking a little bit about that journey? Because- Yeah, that, that, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that is so important. That the distinction is made there because, you know, Browse Light is there to, you know, offer a tool to help people if they need it or for people who don't know that they need it. There are a lot of people out there who do not have access to assistive technology software and a lot of people that don't know that those tools are available. And that's where, that's where Browse Light kind of steps in. But 
it does not try to be the, the magic solution. In fact, as you well know, Deborah, there is no magic solution. There is no one button, one piece of software that you can drop on your website and ta-da, all accessibility issues are fixed and it helps everybody everywhere. That's just not how, that's not how the world works. Um, Even though providers say that is the way it works, just saying. <laughs> yeah, they do. Some say, people do. This is so confusing because really, wow. But that is what they're saying. They say that all the time. They are. And, and on the face of it, if you're, um, for example, an organization, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yes, you know, it, 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 it sounds like something you would want. But well, there, imagine, but yeah. <laughs> But there yeah. is a danger there and there are so many trade-offs there as well, which is, you know, that's why we decided with BrowseLight not to go down that route. And um, in fact, just that is, that's kind of a good journey that we've been on really a, a desktop. I mean, we started off with BrowseLight and we, we are at the same conclusion you're at, Deborah, where it's not the only tool. You need to have more tools in there and not just tools, the people behind those tools as well. So that's the, that's the journey that we're, we're taking that product on now. So what I kind of want to talk about with you today, um, and it seems apt that we were, we were talking about this together, um, you know, given your work in the field, is, is about building an accessibility culture within yeah. organizations. And um, like we all know that, you know, being accessible is the right thing to do. We all know that, but we don't always know how it is that we can get there. And much less do we know how we can build a culture for how we can get there as well. Because a, a culture is one of those things that just a culture can just happen. It just happens overnight. You can you can create a culture, right. but you can lead it. You can lead it in the direction that you want to go. Um, and and the start of that journey, um, I think, is really who who starts that journey? Who does it? One of the questions I always get asked actually as a CTO is, who looks after your accessibility and text help? Just that one person, the one right, accessibility right, right. person. <laughs> You know, that one person, right? Yeah, doing. yeah, exactly. And that, that even the accessibility in itself, that's an all encompassing single term. So whenever I hear that question, I usually break into a smile and then have to clear about 30, 45 minutes of my calendar uh, as <laughs> I go off on a run. But, you know, accessibility is no one person's job. It's, it's everybody's job throughout your entire organization. Everybody has a small part to play in making sure that your organization is more accessible. So if you don't have a, a, an accessible workplace, for example, you're creating a culture in doing that where you don't want to attract top talent or you do want to attract talent um, from disabled people. Right. Uh, if you, your website is inaccessible, uh, inaccessible, then you're turning away people who may rely on your website for information and products. If your social media is inaccessible, you're excluding disabled people from the conversation that everybody else is having. Right. So, uh, you know, accessibility is the heart of everything that we do in the workplace. So it, it can't be boiled down just to one person. And it can't okay. be boiled down just to one thing. Um, so to, to answer the question, like, who looks after your accessibility? That's everyone, everyone in your organization. But obviously you, you need management at the top of that to say it is a focus for us. It is a focus for our culture and it is a focus for our people that we can improve our inclusion and accessibility throughout the organization. Um, so at, at TechSub, actually what we've done is we sort of stood back, obviously we're an assistive technology company anyway. And um, so we, we've been doing things obviously over the years that make this a, a, an inclusive and an accessible place to work. But we wanted to step back and, and really give us a definition of that. How, you know, how do we be better as well? How do we get to being a, a more accessible and a more inclusive organization? And um, so we put together a 10 point what we call the accessibility journey of text help um, because every organization is on a journey of building culture. So this is our own personal journey. And you can actually find out more about our journey at text.help forward slash journey. There's a lot to it, loads of points. Um, but it's essentially 10 points that are going to help us become more uh, inclusive and a more accessible organization. And that involves every, there's one point in there for everybody in the organization developers, HR, content specialists, marketing, design, everybody. And it involves all aspects of the organization as well. And things that you might not even really initially think about, like the documents that you're sharing within your organization, are right. they accessible? Can they be read by screen readers? 
can your staff and your employees understand those documents? It's not just your public facing website, it's everything that happens yeah. within your organization. Um, and, and I think as well, I mean, I know you've done an awful lot of work in this field, but having a, a clear plan on how you can meet those goals and, and having easily achievable goals as well is uh, the first step to driving cultural change across the organization. I agree. And, and uh, when I wrote my book, Inclusion Branding, I talked about that. I also talked about it in the book before that, uh, Tapping into Hidden Human Capital. And I did what it sounds like y'all have done in that I explained that accessibility belongs to everybody. But as you're pointing out, we all have different roles to play with accessibility. You're the chief technology officer. You have to make sure you have the right processes in place and the right quality control, quality assurance and testing. The marketing people have to make, so everybody has, everybody's responsible for it, but they have different roles. And I um, would be very interested in your 10 points. I'm going to, can we find those on your website? Is that yes, part you of can. Yeah, part? they're on uh, our, our texthelp.com website and there's a lot okay, of short good. link as well, text.help forward slash journey and that will okay, show you the, the 10 points and a little bit of detail about them as well well i just think it's such an important point and i want to dig into um some more in a minute but i i want to um just talk a little bit about the confusion in the marketplace and so um i of course am in the states and you're joining from northern ireland and um here in the states we have a lot of investors stemming up and wanting to buy companies like text to help. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you're already being approached. And there's quite a few dollars that, you know, are being spent. I mean, the essential accessibility just got a $55 million investment. Um, so, and then um, level access, I think got like 35 million or something. And so we're seeing money being spent, but I will say that I don't necessarily see the community of people with disabilities benefiting from the money that is going into these companies. And sometimes I feel they actually hurt our community because we, um, we lose what we already have, um, which is fine. There's just confusion in the marketplace. And I still have investors reaching out to me all the time, asking me who to buy. And I continue to remind them, please also remember to look outside the states. We see a lot of innovation happening outside the states, but there's so much confusion at the same time. And I was speaking, and I'm not going to say who, because it would be so inappropriate to, but I was speaking to somebody yesterday who just got into the accessibility field. And so they were like, oh, I have a grandchild with autism, which is great. I have, you know, my daughter has Down syndrome. My, my husband has dementia. I myself am a person with disabilities, invisible disabilities. So I, I welcome everyone. Everyone's welcome. But what worries me sometimes when these people come into the field and they do not understand the nuances of the field. Um, for example, this person said, you know, he had a friend that was wheelchair bound. Well, people are not tied up to their wheelchair, they're wheelchair users, and it's just a little nuance. But, you know, the community doesn't like, you know, it's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work that we need to do. But the, so once again, come into the field, yay, but please be responsible enough to learn the field so that you don't accidentally do more damage than good, which we see happening right now, especially in the States. And then, of course, we're litigating everything. We're suing each other in the States, which is good in a way, because if you're not going to make things accessible and I'm going to have to hit you over the head with this stick to make you do it. I'm sorry that I had to do that. And I'm sorry that you didn't understand that you actually have a very powerful business case for doing it, as you said, but we're going to make you do it in the States. And so I am proud of us at least for doing that, even though I think it's ridiculous, we have to do it. And so the, uh, and it, uh, I know that Antonio is having technical problems, so he's trying to come back in, but but it, also what's confusing, and I know this is part of y'all's journey, is that we have providers stepping in and saying, all you have to do is put this overlay tool over um, and you're done. Woohoo. And all you need is put this assistive technology tools here and you're done. And it's just not true. And I've had people say to me at conferences, they'll come and get me because they know I'm talking about this and they'll have big signs behind them advertising, like behind you right now, um, Matt, you have text to help logo. Hey, hello, Antonio. Can you hear us? Yes, I can, Deborah. 
Oh, yay. Welcome. Welcome. I told the audience that you were having technical problems. So, um, so just to continue this point and then, um, uh, but so, so what's happening is that they'll say to me, oh, we have this wonderful overlay tool and, um, you know, all you have to do is just do this one thing and you're done. And I'll say, okay, great. That's all you have to do. And th this particular instance, they had behind them on the sign behind them that you're fully accessible and you're 508 compliant, which 508 is of course the US thing. And so I being a little bit cheeky was like, great. So all I have to do is put this overlay tool and I'm totally done. So all my videos are captured. Well, no, 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 no. Well, um, all my PDFs are accessible. Well, no, all my apps are accessible. Well, no, well, I, I'm so confused because it says behind you that I'll be fully accessible and 508 compliant. Well, no, no, no. All it does, and so it, it causes a lot of confusion. And I know that was also part of y'all's journey, which you talked about. But why did text to help say, no, that's we don't want to do that. We want to help. We don't want to confuse. But I was just wondering if you would explore that. And then, you know, um, yeah. I, I want to I'd love to actually, help. because, you know, as you said, there, if there was some sort of magic algorithm we could use to make everything accessible in every way possible, that would be fantastic. Uh, Textup have been doing this for 20 years. We have been talking to people with accessibility needs and disabilities for 20 years and gathering feedback every day. Every single last one of our products has a button inside it that you will be able to click on or open and give feedback as a disabled user. And we get that feedback and that goes straight into the product, straight into our, um, our, our product owners, straight to us. And we've been looking at that. And, there is so many things in there that you would never be able to do with one line of code. Not but people with, you know, you cannot, you cannot cover everybody with an accessibility term. People with cognitive impairments, motor impairments, visual impairments, you know, um, temporary disabilities, long-term disabilities. There, there are so many different ways that you, can, you need to help people that no one tool, no one line of code is going to fix absolutely everything for you. But what you can do, is you can give people the information necessary to create the most accessible experience for your users. You can give them the knowledge necessary and you can give them the ability to spread awareness as well of accessibility. And that is by far and away the, the most powerful tool. You can have much more powerful than any other one-liner special toolbar. <clears throat> as you mentioned, Deborah, as well, in the past, we had our, our browse loud toolbar, which added on supports on top right. of your existing supports. And right. so they weren't designed for replacing a screen reader, for example. You still need a screen reader and browse loud and side by side. Um, your website still needed to be accessible for browse loud to even work on your website. And um, so what we, what we have done is we've obviously noticed that there are some gaps. People are saying, you know, well, how do I make my website accessible? And we would sit down and give them a little bit of training, explain how to do that, you know how you can make it a little bit better. Um, but there was obviously a, a gap there. So what we've done is we've kind of evolved the idea of Browse Loud. Um, it is no longer just Browse Loud on its own. We, we call our, our new product Reach Deck. And it is actually a suite of tools um, that it, do, it doesn't fix anything, okay? But what it does is encourages and promotes an accessibility culture throughout your entire organization using terms uh, using using tools, I should say. And so that, that's sort of both in the way of being technically accessible. I like to I like to use the word technically accessible with stuff like WKI compliance, you know, making sure your, your content is structured correctly on your website. And then um, content accessibility as well, which is writing content that your audience can understand and writing it in a way that they can consume as well. So we've got a suite of tools that allow you to make your, your website technically accessible and your content content accessible as well. We've kind of broken it into um, three different tools. Um, the first one, uh, I'm going to talk about browse light last because it's a nice to have at the end of the day. Uh, but the first tool we have in here is called the auditor. And what the auditor does is helps you with that technical accessibility. It goes and scans your website and it identifies any WCAG 2.1 compliance errors you've got there, and it will report those to you. It does not fix them for you. It is not magic. I wish it was magic, but it is not because, you know, even the WCAG guidelines themselves, not everything can be fixed automatically through, through a machine. 
it requires somebody looking at that and, and you know and making their own decisions having human input at the end of the day um, but what it does do is is quickly highlight areas of your website that are obviously inaccessible and give your developers the information that they need to be able to fix it quickly um, because that, that's part of that idea of you know making these you don't want a magic bullet that hides away all that information from you. You want something that trains your developers. This is how you spot issues. This is how you identify them. And this is how you fix them so that they can then, whenever they're developing, make sure that those issues do not creep into their, into their websites. Um, and better than that, it gives you all this information. But at the end of it, it generates a report for your entire website. And we all know how much management loves reports. Oh, they yeah. love reports. They, they can't get enough of them. <laughs> Um, so that report will tell you exactly what areas of your website need work um, and what areas of your website you need to spend time in and perhaps even deliver training to your staff on how to make that part of your website accessible as well. So that auditor helps you then refer back to, in our case, our 10 point plan and say, okay, well, how far along are we in creating a WCAG accessible website? Report, great, we're not there yet, we need to get better. Uh, and, you know, we also have to remember that your website doesn't just be finished one day and is magically accessible and stays that way forever. It's a constantly evolving thing. You need to be making sure that the, the new content you're putting on there is accessible and that there's no other errors that have crept in and if any changes in your website are, again, accessible for your end users as well. So not only does it check for technical accessibility, but it also checks for that content accessibility as well. So it, it keeps an eye for things like uh, the use of complicated phrases or what we call in the UK like jargon words, um, especially for English language learners as well. He, he sometimes struggle with it in English language if you're putting in sort of colloquialisms into your website, it can be very difficult for them to understand. Um, it also keeps an eye for like, um, unnecessarily long sentences. Um, so people like that with memory impairments um, sort of, you know, will want to information chunked into smaller pieces, smaller, smaller consumable pieces for them as well. So it keeps an eye for those as well. Um, and, and reading age as well in particular is very important. And um, one of the stats that you know I always say to people as well is that in the UK here, the average reading age of somebody in the UK is just nine years old. Wow. So if, if you're writing content on your website, for example, and, and say you're a government website or a local council website or something, and you're running your, your reading age for somebody who's 18, 20 years old, there is a good chance that 50 to 70% of the people who need that content will not be able to understand it. And they, they, will, they will go somewhere else for that content or they might not get it at all. You know? And that is not leveling the playing field in any way, shape or form. Everybody has the right to access that information and it's our responsibility an organization's responsibility to make sure that they can as well. So the, the auditor scans your website, but that means that those problems have happened. They are, they're, they're right there. Your users are seeing them right now. So how do you sort of prevent that from happening in the first place? Well, training is an obvious thing. You know, reach out to your accessibility experts. There are loads of them in the field, as you well know, Deborah. There are loads of them out there in the field that can give you advice, give you training, how to be more accessible and how to create an accessible website. But from a content accessibility point of view, that is something that is, you know, that we can manage with tools. You know, we can help you identify things and help you um, make things better, write your content for your audience. And that's where we've introduced our editor tool in ReadStack. So that's a tool that can be used by anyone in your organization that writes content. If you're using a word processor, if you're using Microsoft Word or Google Docs all day, you can use the editor and in real time, it will tell you what jargon words you're using, what confusable terms you're using that people might not understand. And um, it'll also give you helpful metrics like spelling, punctuation and grammar. So the, the, the objective there is to catch those errors before your users see them and, and present something to your users that they can understand, they can access, and then they can consume. So well, to make sure that we have that level playing field for absolutely everybody. Well, I, I know that Antonio has a question, but I think the thing that I can, I was impressed before by Browse Aloud, but I haven't talked to you in years, but 
you make the website more usable and accessible as people are making sure they're following all the WCAG rules and the programming in the background, which is powerful. Um, Antonio, let me turn it over to you and welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Ryan. No, uh, I, I was um, talking with with um, some companies in Germany this week uh, about uh, uh, services for, from from text to speech, speaks to to text. I was on an um, event on on privacy and security under the banner of the European Commission uh, this week. So and so my question goes in, in into the, do those two areas. Uh, considering that you are dealing with uh, text to speech and speak to text, how can uh, how can we make sure that the privacy of the users uh, is at upfront, and how we also make sure that you know that sometimes uh, this is something that we are observing is that people working in in information and security sometimes disregard the needs of uh, uh, users with disabilities, and they don't they don't even try to make an effort to understand the importance of these type of services and even without doing any kind of assessment they're already blocking them so uh, is also a, a level of ignorance and awareness that needs to be created so how can we make sure that security that we all care about doesn't limit the rights of people with disabilities from just doing their work uh, that was such a really good question, Antonio. And, and you know what, I actually used to be a, a security architect at TechStop in, in my previous role. So it's another thing I care you know, passionately about is security and privacy. Um, to, to answer your second question first about how, how do we stop those barriers from happening? If somebody needs that piece of software, they should get it. If they need something to understand the content, they need something to help use it, they should get it. And that is a cultural change. That's, that's what we're, we're talking about here. That, that needs to be not just siloed away that, oh, developers deal with accessibility because everybody, security and the people who run your network, the people who authorize your applications and your, your senior, everyone right from the board members all the way down to the, across the organization should know that accessibility tools exist and are a requirement for people. They really are. And, and so your first point there um, about the privacy and um, specifically with speech to text and text to speech tools as well. That's something we're absolutely looking at for Browse Light. I don't want to go into too much detail about uh, robot and future plans, uh, but rest assured the content on the website and, and leaving, um, particularly obviously in the, in the realms of the EU is something we've been looking at. And I, and I think actually technology is now at a really good standard whereby we have um, access to local text to speech and local speech to text so that we don't need to go to the we don't need to go to the cloud for everything things do not need to leave you know um, users machines and if we have that and we have that in place so we, we've, we've created the culture we've removed the technical barriers to giving access to the people the tools they need you're going to be doing very hard as, a, as an administrator in an organization to say no to that I think nor should you no, I, I was quite quite worried because, as you uh, as you uh, might know, uh, um, around you know the, the European Commission is organizing uh, you know working groups to work on on track uh, on security, on accessibility, on, on on privacy, and these groups they tend to influence sometimes sometimes policy, and often there's uh, uh, we have the accessibility advocates on the accessibility groups and not on this particular group, so. When there's a conversation on privacy, uh, there's nobody that say, hey, "Sorry, we need to address this." And and this happens. You know, I, I I've been tracking uh, events. You know, over the last couple of years, it's systematic, uh, and and is it, is quite. And and some, we're talking about events that are sponsored by MPs. So uh, I think it's and, and we have in place the the European accessibility guidelines, and there's always this fact that people forget that needs to be a discussion on the topic of accessibility and privacy. Yeah, absolutely. Systematic is, is exactly the right word to use. That's exactly what it is. And, and it, it goes back to the point where that Deborah was making earlier on as well about um, people trying to create accessibility solutions without listening to the people 
with accessibility needs. And those, those are the people that you need to be listening to. You know, you shouldn't be put, trying to push a security agenda with only a security agenda lens. It's not going to work. You need to take the people into account who require those tools um, to be able to live their daily lives. So, so if you uh, look, looking back to the change of technology uh, uh, that we have been of observing in the last couple of months, uh, and you know, we you know, we we know that today uh, some tools uh, that allow people to improve their daily experience they, they they improve massively. You know, they are more they are more present. Uh, sometimes they don't address the issues of all users. But at least uh, they fix some small parts. You, know, you you can have uh, text uh, to speech on, on your browser, and 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 it works fine. It, it works for some people. It might not work for for everyone. So the 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 tools the tools are here. So uh, if you if you work particularly in the area of education, because today we have so many uh, kids uh, doing part of their tasks from home, uh, and sometimes parents are not that digitally skilled to best advise them in terms of the tools, what do they need to consider to make sure that if children have certain needs that they're able to help them and at the same time they, they're able to make sure that the kids don't feel frustrated because they're not able to learn or they're not able to use the tools that were predefined to them. So what solutions are out there that can help families? Yeah. Really good point as well, Antonio. So obviously, as a as a technology, so we we have a lot of products there for students and, uh, and for for teachers as well. So we've obviously observed over the past twelve months the issues that students are, are coming into and the, the issues that um, parents as well are coming into. One of the big issues really is is a lack of access to devices. You know, this is all well and good for us sitting saying that, you know, let's all work from home. We've all got some nice uh, laptops, cameras, and, um, you know, but whenever you, the, the, the students go home, they might not have access to those things. And if they do, and there may be one device per household that is shared between a number of people. I very often see technology companies say, we've got an iOS app, nothing else. That's it, nothing for Chromebooks, nothing for Android, um, nothing for any of those other platforms. And if you're doing that, you are excluding access for one child who may have an Android, another child who may have a, an iPhone or a Chromebook. And if they can't all use the same tools, they are not being afforded the same rights. They are not being afforded the same, um, the same experience as their peers. And I think that is a real key thing that people tend to overlook whenever they're thinking about how do we deliver our software. Having a, a solution that works across all platforms is a must in today's technology environment. Um, another thing as well is, um, and I haven't really mentioned that today, um, I'm surprised I haven't because I always talk about this topic whenever I'm talking about accessibility, and that's the UX of your applications too, because accessibility and UX are the same thing they, they, they are you know, together as one whenever you're developing software. And um, you need to make sure that that UX is not um, a barrier to your students being able to use it either at home or in the classroom. You need to make sure your tools as well work with other tools. That's very important because there is no one, as you, as you say, Antonio, no one tool can do everything, but you need to make sure that your tool is compatible with another tool. You need to make sure your tool is compatible with screen readers and make sure that your editor is compatible with other editors and other formats um, and, and being able to be read as well. Um, so I, I think there's, a, there's lots of stuff there, um, particularly in students and particularly over the past 12 months. But those are the, the key takeaways for me. I, I have... A, I... I, I think this is such good points that you're bringing up, especially as Antonio is mentioning the the privacy and the security, because it, it must all be done together. Um, and also, when things are really accessible, um, it benefits everybody. And, and that's what we continue to remind people. But I, I'm curious, Ryan, who, you know, so it sounds like you do what you, you all work with a lot of schools and universities, but are you working with corporations. I'm just curious 
who your customers are? Sure. I mean, for, for our reach tech product and, and previously Bryce Light as well, that is a lot more corporations. Okay. And we also have a product as well, a version of Lean Light for the workplace, specifically and for workplace needs. Um, and that again goes back to that UX difference between you know students who need a, a, a particular UX and, and people in the workplace who need a particular UX. And so like that, um, we, we take an awful lot of feedback from people in the workplace as, as well as students as well. Um, although having said that, you know, people always tend to think that once you go into the workplace, you, sort of, you leave your, your accessible needs behind in school. People tend to always think, you know, um, for example, dyslexia just stops once you leave school, which it doesn't. No, no. <laughs> people who no, move into the workplace that. are still dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they yeah. still need access to those tools there as well. And um, I think that's very important. Even more so because you want them to be productive and they want to be productive. Exactly. So one thing that we saw um, during COVID-19 and Antonio alluded to some of this is we saw here in the States where people with disabilities do not want to identify if possible, just because, you know, we have disenfranchised people, but um, we saw more people. Um, disclosing that they had disabilities because a lot of people started understanding what we've been talking about all this time. And, you know, and it sounds like your tools could be a very important, because one, I wrote an article a long time ago, I think it was around 2016. And I said, can overlay tools be part of your strategic plan towards accessibility? Um, because I was hopeful that maybe some of these tools could help people as they were doing the work they needed to do to make sure that accessibility has been implemented through all of the process, all of the DNA of the uh, corporation, the organization. Um, but sadly, a lot of those tools just didn't even do what they said they were going to do. So, But I do believe that your tools could do that. Your tools, it's not going to make everybody accessible, but it is definitely going to make your uh, website, your products, your services more accessible. And at the same time, you do the training and encourage them to still do the work you have to do. You have to blend accessibility into the DNA of your whole organization. Yep. So, but I, right now I've lost major confidence in most of the overlay tools, major. I, I just can't recommend any of them, but I was wondering, it, do y'all, do you believe that's true? I, I believe there is a place for um, certain tools to be used to be able to help people to do the things that they need to do. And, and, and also then to raise awareness as well that those tools are there. Particularly in the workplace, actually, one of the things we, we see quite often in, in text help is workplaces say uh, we don't either we don't have any disabled people or we don't have that many d disabled people. And then they get a product like ReadStack or, or Read and Write and they roll it out and say, hey, loads of people are using this. What, what's that about? <laughs> right. What's that about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then then you realize, then you realize that the part that those tools can have. So because then you make people aware that they, they do need certain supports. And if you are using certain supports in certain places, then that highlights to the organization, hey, do you know what? People are using reading supports, for example, in our documents really heavily. Why is that? That is because your, your documents are unreadable. Um, you're, you're using tiny fonts that nobody can read, or your brand colors are things that um, users cannot see or do not have an appropriate con contrast as well. Um, and I, I, I do think there though, that is, the, that is the key thing, Deborah, is that we can use these tools for good, but we need to use them in the right way. We need right. to, to communicate it in the right way. And we need to remember that, that fundamentally, they are not there to solve a problem. They are there to make sure that that problem does not exist in the first place. Ooh, well said. Because everybody, everybody is entitled to the same experience as everybody else. And a tool should not need to be there. But if it is there, it can be there at the right time. And its job is just to remove those barriers for absolutely everybody. Right, I agree. I know that um, the time has gone by really fast. And I want to, um, I, first of all, I want to thank our supporters, Barclays Access, um, My Clear Text, and Microlink. We really appreciate you keeping us on air. 
But um, I want to give you the final words. So if you don't mind telling people, you know, how they can reach out to you, you know, what is your website, things like that. But I also want to say that I hear people, one person comes to mind that says, um, we don't need assistive technology. We don't need assistive technology and assistive technology is limiting people with disabilities. And if your websites are fully accessible, you don't need assistive technology. I totally disagree with that comment. And I said that on air because I keep trying to remind this person that I use this, if I'm using a screen reader, I use a screen reader to start my computer and navigate to your website and then, and so I keep reminding him that I have to have assistive technology, but he just feels it's a scam being put on people. No, and, and, no I think we should not dictate uh, what people uh, what people are going to use. You know, uh, yeah. uh, people need to find what works best for them. You know, if people uh, may have be in a situation for this built in different stages of their lives, yes. you know, they can bore, and and it's important that uh, everyone is able to choose solutions. Based in you know, based in in what they can actually do with that tech themselves, you know. I think I that's agree. what we need to do. I agree, and let let's give you the final words, Ryan. Yep. Um, well, finally, just thank you very much, uh, Deborah, Antonio, and Access Chat in general for having me on today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've actually had a lot of fun. We could probably talk about this for for hours oh, on yeah. end, but we'll we'll keep it short. <laughs> And so just to remind everybody, our, our Textop website is www.textop.com. And you can find more about our Textop journey at text.help forward slash journey. And, and, and just as a, as a last reminder as well, that these are tools, but these tools are to help you drive the culture in your organization. So remove those barriers because we want to make sure that everybody is entitled to be able to access the content in the same way as everybody else. That's all we want. And you're right, Antonio, it doesn't matter what tools you use to get there, as long as they work for you, that's the important thing. I agree, well said. Well, thank you, everybody. Lovely, thanks everyone.